Let's read another psalm that, um, from one of you. <clears throat> Glorious big views of minute details, which way shall I go? I could express praise for your presence and power and purposes at work globally and galactically. Great are you, Lord. For your gift to us is the miracle of life, sunrise after sunset, each day filled with wonder and miracles and opportunity to begin a new day, a new task, a new relationship, a new insight, a new healing, a new experience, a new memory. Why can't I live in the big picture? Why do the details creep in and steal my focus? Lord, the interruptions are derailing me day and night. Shall I close myself off, close my ears, my eyes, my mind, my heart? Shall I cultivate indifference so I can enjoy you more? Hold on. My sister called me with a family concern. Wait, the neighbor has a favor to ask. Just a sec. I have to go to the store for groceries. Imagine my life free from interruption. All the time in the world. But for what? Time to regret? Remorse? Lord, I choose to praise you in the interruptions, for in them I see you most clearly, and in them I need you most dearly. Big or small, you are in it all. Now, Psalm today is appropriately at the end of the series, Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and lyre. Praise Him with the timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals, with the sound of resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise His name. Will you pray with me? So Lord, as we look into your word and as we look over the back of these last few weeks um, first of all thank you for how you've spoken to us thank you for how you've um, given each of us um, psalms to write and thank you for everything that you've revealed as you've read these psalms aloud we pray for um, the word about to be preached you speak powerfully through it, and um, we ask all this in your mighty name. Amen. So as we come to the end of the series, I've been thinking a lot about um, the Psalms, and mostly about why God decided to give us the Psalms in this book, in the Bible. We have looked at a lot of individual Psalms, and um, we've gleaned a lot from individual psalms. But I wanted to ask the question, as a whole, why did God put this book in the Bible? Because in many ways, the psalms are an odd book. It doesn't have a story to tell, not like Genesis or Exodus or the Gospels. You know, we don't follow a narrative. We don't follow a central character, whether it's Moses or Isaiah or Ruth or Jesus. It's not a set of laws like Leviticus or Numbers. It's not even a book, like Pro a book of advice like Proverbs, but instead what we get is a random collection of songs that we don't have any music for. A random collection of songs that we don't have any music for. So why would God include it amongst everything else that he could have included in the Bible? And don't get me wrong, I'm not questioning the place of the Psalms in the Bible. I think it, there are many reasons why God has given us the Psalms. But today I just want to focus on um, one of those reasons, I think. And I think what the Psalms show us is what it means to worship with all our being. The Psalms show us what it means to worship with all our being. So as some of you may have guessed, I spent a lot of time thinking about worship. I have no idea why, it might be the job I have, who knows. <laughs> But I remember, so I've, I've been thinking about worship for a long time, and I remember when I first started getting into worship, which was like, more than 10 years ago. Yeah. 
I had a very different perspective of what was and what wasn't appropriate worship. I used to think that worship is strictly the lifting up of praise and adoration to our God. That's what worship was. And I came to this understanding because every church that I went to seemed to do that and do it very well. The songs we sang were uplifting, the choruses were anthemic, the music was upbeat, or it was epic. And as worship leaders, it seemed that our goal, um, our goal was to get people from whatever state of mind they were in, into a place where they were praising God exuberantly. That was our job. Whenever we picked songs, whenever we got the teams together, whenever we worked on the music, that was the job. Get people from wherever they are to a place where they're praising exuberantly. And so I developed a theology of worship where the basic purpose of why we do it is so that we can chuck aside all the bad and negative stuff at the door so that you could praise God. You know, get all of that out of the way. And I started to live that way as a worship leader. You know, I would spend hours upon hours before every service um, trying to do everything that I could either to, you know, make me not angry, God. Make me not angry today, God. Make me not sad today, God. Help me bottle up all my negative emotions so that by the time I get to leading the people of God, I'm in a more positive place so I can be more positive to the people of God. I would try and keep my anger in check, hide my depressions, mask my anxieties. And of course, I, I, would, I would do this all spiritually, you know, deep in prayer, deep in earnest, um, devotion to God, asking God, take away my negativity so I can worship Him freely. And I could... And the reason why I would do this is, again, it seemed that there was no place for negativity in worship. I could see that most of the praise songs that we sung, at least when I was growing up, they were from the Psalms, and all these songs were always uplifting, were always upbeat. I got to thinking that, you know, that's exactly what the Psalms taught us to do in worship. Because all the songs that I heard in worship were upbeat. All we had to do, and so what we had to do was to chuck all our negative stuff at the door. The Psalms, the book of worship of God, seemed to be telling me that what I needed to do was be upbeat. And at some point I decided, you know, I, I want to just check this out. I want to investigate it for real. Is this really what the Bible said? Is this really what the Psalms was about? So as I was getting more and more involved in worship, I decided at some point, I'm going to read through this whole book. I'm going to actually read through it. I heard bits and pieces and, you know, but now I'm actually going to read through the whole book and see what the Psalms had to teach me. And I was shocked at what I found. Because you see, Psalms 1 starts off nice. <laughs> Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. That sounds churchy enough. Yeah, that sounds about, you know, so worship is upbeat and uplifting. But then I stumble upon Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and people plot in vain? I went on to verse Psalm 3. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Psalm 4. Answer me when I call to you. Give me relief from my distress. These sounded less and less and less like the praise and worship songs I was listening to, I was hearing in church. They sounded more and more like the emotions and thoughts I was trying to keep bottled up. The stuff I was trying to check at the door. And as I continued to read the Psalms, I began to see that this was not, this is not an isolated trend in the book. It's not like, you know, it starts off great, it gets a bit bumpy for four or five Psalms, and then it moves into the praise and worship that we're all used to. It's not an aberration. But the Psalms is in many ways the most human book of the Bible. It is filled with songs of doubts and insecurities, like Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those famous words said by Christ on the cross. It is filled with people expressing their lack of joy and thanksgiving. Like in Psalm 42, my soul is downcast within me. 
It is filled with raw and desperate emotions that we rarely utter in church. Like in Psalm 77, will the Lord reject forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? That was the last time you heard that in worship. And so we could go on and on and on and find people over and over again expressing anxiety and fear and woe. And I was faced with this conundrum. Because sure, don't get me wrong, it's not like the Psalms doesn't have joy and thanksgiving in it. I found many Psalms, like Psalm 150, which we read today, which fit right in the wheelhouse of the praise and worship music that we're so familiar with. But I found many more that were not. More often than not, the psalmists were frustrated, were angry, were scared. And for a while, I tried to justify these problem psalms by thinking that maybe perhaps these psalms, you know, they were meant for private devotions. They're private prayers that we, um, that we utter. But, you know, they're not appropriate for the whole church to say together. They're not appropriate when we gather together as one body. And I think I said that because again, I never heard these psalms in worship ever. I had never seen the expression of doubts, of fears, of anxieties, of insecurities as something that was positive in worship. Instead, I had, I had been groomed to think that when we come on Sunday, we put on our Sunday best not just in what we wear, but in our hearts as well. So while these songs were good to read by ourselves, or even maybe to preach on once in a while, they're not worship. And I hope you can see how absurd I was to think that way. Because the Psalms are not a private collection of poems written by individuals to God. These are songs of public worship. The most troublesome psalms that we have such a hard time writing music for today, these psalms were the hymns of ancient Israel. These were the songs that the people of Israel would sing publicly in the temple. This is the song book God has given to us. In these psalms, God is intent trying to teach us something about what the nature of worship really is. And I think the, the reason God has given us these psalms are not just the happy, clappy ones that we're so familiar with. The reason why is because God wants to desperately blow out of the water the myth that we're supposed to check our stuff at the door when we come and worship Him. God wants to blow up the myth that what He wants from us in worship is our Sunday best. When God calls us into his presence, he calls for all of us to come. The last thing God wants from us is to hide something away from him. The last thing God wants us to do is pretend that we're something we're not. But he wants us to bring all of ourselves into worship. Even and especially our fears, our doubts, our anxieties, our anger, our depression, he wants us to bring our angst. None of these things, God is, does not think any of these things are inappropriate for him. God calls for all of us to come before his throne. Because as long as we hold back a part of ourselves, as long as we keep trying to think that we can keep things at the door and not before his throne, as long as we keep trying to put on our best appearance on Sunday, he can't work in and through us. Last week, Jenna made mention of, you know, um, in Psalm 42, the psalmist's problem in there was that he thought that God was only in Jerusalem. And when he was far away, he couldn't figure out how he could worship God in Jerusalem. And he had to realize that no, what he had done was created a box too small for God. And I think we do that too with our emotions. 
joy and thanksgiving and praise, these are things that are appropriate for God, but fears and doubts, insecurities, these are things we'll keep away. We compartmentalize our life so that God only occupies part of it. And God in the book of Psalms calls us to change that. Because, because it's only when we come into worship and bring our anger before His throne that He's able to bring peace. It's only when we bring our depression and our downtroddenness that He's able to lift us up. It's only when we allow our hurts, our doubts, and our worries to be a part of how we worship that He can comfort us. It's only when we're brave enough to admit our fears that He can dispel them. It's only when we are willing to worship God in our brokenness that He can heal us and make us whole. So stop hiding. Even today, I'm, I've been reminded of that fact. Because um, last night, Jenna and I had a tiny scare of our own with regards to our little one on the way. Now, it's nothing bad. Let's just get that out of the way. It's nothing bad. It was just one of those things that, you know, as first time parents to be, something weird happens and you think, is this it? <laughs> is this the moment when we have to pack up everything and head to the hospital and run? And um, again, it turned out to be nothing, but it was enough to set me off, <laughs> to set me ajar. Because I realized, like, oh man, I have all these things I have to get ready and I'm not ready yet. <laughs> And the best part was it happened right before I was about to go to bed. So I got very little sleep last night. <laughs> and so I stand here today. I'm a little frazzled. I'm a quite exhausted. I'm a little bit unhinged. But the Psalms remind me that this is not something I need to hide from God. I can say, Lord, here I stand, I'm a little shaken, I'm very tired, I'm not quite in it today. But I don't need to hide because you have invited me to come. It's when we bring all of ourselves, warts and all, to God. Then He heals us, and then He gives us the strength to rejoice. And today we have another opportunity to bring all of ourselves to God. Communion is not one of those things where God says, come to me only when you're at your best. But Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and brokenhearted, and I will give you rest. And in the Psalms, in Psalm 51, it says, it's not a spirit that is put together that God accepts, but a broken and contrite spirit he will not despise but He desires truth in our innermost being. He wants us to show everything. I have one more psalm to read, and then I have to run back up and lead worship again. So John's going to take over. But, yeah, hear these words, and let this be a close. Father, let my heart be open before you, and receptive to your voice in all of your expression of who you are and the love you have, you have expressed to mankind. Whether rich or poor, having more than I could ever use or nothing, your love has provided all that I will ever need. A treasure that can never be used up, with more always available irrespective of circumstance or humanity's failings or accomplishments. My place in life does not limit or expand the love you have expressed to me. All that I have been or will be cannot deny or render impotent the love you have expressed to me and to all mankind. The offer you make to each of us is as we are. So let me live in a place of embracing you, alive to your presence, secure in who you are, trusting, loving, living life in the moment of time that is now.